high-explosive bomb of the type used to attack cities in the last war is a weapon which utilizes the energy produced by the chemical reaction of matter such as TNT. This release of energy takes the form of a shock wave commonly known as blast. The explosion of one atomic bomb releases as much energy as thousands of tons of TNT. This release of energy becomes manifest in three forms, heat, radiation, and blast, this latter being by far the most important. The effects of the atomic bomb on the selected target depend on three factors. First, the nature of the target. Second, the power of the bomb. And third, the height at which the bomb is detonated. For the purpose of this film, we shall assume that the target will be a large British city and that the power of the bomb will be equivalent to the explosive force of 20,000 tons of TNT. This size is known as a nominal bomb. The assumed height of detonation will be 1,000 feet above the city. This is about the height at which maximum destruction would be caused to a British city. To explode the bomb below this height would reduce the area of destruction, while to explode it at a greater height would reduce its power to destroy large steel-framed buildings. If the bomb were to be more powerful than the nominal, then the height of detonation would be greater. Now we'll examine the three kinds of effects. First, there is that of heat. The heat originates at the moment of detonation and continues for some seconds. The gaseous products of the explosion glow and form what is called the ball of fire. It expands rapidly and as it cools, it shoots up into the atmosphere at an initial speed of 200 miles an hour. The gases then form into the familiar mushroom-shaped cloud at a height of some 40,000 feet. Although the heat flash is of very short duration, it can cause considerable damage. The heat from it will scorch and may set on fire any exposed inflammable material up to a distance of two miles on a clear day. Atmospheric conditions play an important part in the effect of heat. On a misty or foggy day, the range of the heat flash will be greatly reduced. Effect number two is that of nuclear radiation. The effect of radiation becomes manifest in two forms. First, immediate radiation, and second, residual radiation. There is immediate radiation of gamma rays and neutrons at the time of the explosion. They are centered in the rising ball of fire, which carries them out of range within less than one minute after the explosion. The gamma rays travel at the speed of light in all directions from the explosion. They have a lethal range of about three quarters of a mile to any person directly exposed to them or insufficiently shielded from them. Beyond this point, the power of the rays fall off rapidly. They do not make the objects they strike radioactive. The neutrons are atomic particles produced in the explosion, which have the power to make some materials which they strike radioactive. Their effect is largely outweighed by that of the gamma rays. The second form of radiation is that known as residual radiation. This consists chiefly of gamma rays which arise from deposited radioactive material and to a lesser extent from material made radioactive by the neutrons. Since only a small fraction of radioactive material ever reaches the ground, the danger from residual radiation is much less than from immediate radiation. These gamma and other rays are less concentrated and they only become dangerous to human life if a person is exposed to them for a long time. In the case of a bomb detonated at 1,000 feet, there would be relatively little danger from residual radiation. Last, but by no means least, we come to the third effect that of blast. This effect is caused by a shock wave resulting from the sudden and terrific heat produced by the release of atomic energy. 
With the normal types of explosive used in the last war, detonation of the bomb usually occurred on or after impact with the ground. Thus, the side of the buildings nearest to it would be affected. In the case of an atomic bomb detonated in the air, the blast effect is largely downwards and outwards. Thus, beneath the explosion, it affects all sides of a building simultaneously. Further away, it becomes a sideways push. The blast effect will severely damage buildings up to a distance of a mile and a half from the explosion. So there we have the three kinds of energy atomic bomb. Heat, radiation, and blast. And the relative effect of each if a nominal bomb is detonated at 1,000 feet above the ground. If the atomic bomb is detonated on impact or below ground level, like this, the effect is somewhat different. A very deep crater would be formed and it would be surrounded by a great ring of crater debris. The blast effect would be considerably less, although there would be a large area around the crater where buildings would be collapsed by earthquake effects. The danger from heat flash and immediate radiation would be less, since the insulating properties of the earth on the sides of the crater would absorb the greater part of them. But the danger from residual radiation would be greatly increased in the vicinity of the crater. The same applies to an underwater explosion. Considering once more our nominal bomb detonated at 1,000 feet, let us get some idea of the area that would be affected. The area may be divided into three circles, the first of which will be a quarter of a mile radius from the point under the explosion. This point is known as ground zero. Within this quarter mile circle, the target will be completely devastated. The second circle, drawn at a radius of three quarters of a mile from ground zero, will contain a large number of buildings totally or partially destroyed. The third circle, at a distance of a mile and a half from ground zero, marks the limit of houses suffering severe structural damage. Outside this area, the damage will be progressively less severe, tailing off at about two miles. If such a bomb were detonated over London, the relative area affected would be approximately this size. Over Birmingham, the relative area would be this size. Over Glasgow, this size. And over Liverpool, this size. Now we will take an imaginary city, call it Sheffingham, a typical British city of half a million people, and see more clearly what the effects of the atomic bomb might be. The air raid warning has sounded and people are in the shelters. atomic bomb has burst over Sheffingham. Within a radius stretching out to a mile and a half from ground zero, a large number of buildings are destroyed and many are burning. Let's take a closer look and see what it looked like before and then after the bomb had exploded. There is no need to study the whole area, as it may be presumed that the effects are similar at comparable distances from ground zero in any direction. So we'll take a slice or sector of the circle, like this. Now here is a portion of Sheffingham, about a quarter of a mile from ground zero before the explosion. First there was the flash, and then the blast. This entire area is now devastated. That is to say that it is more than 80% totally destroyed. As a result, the fires here will be of little consequence, 
but the spread of rubble may make the locating of air raid shelters and the ultimate rescue of their occupants extremely difficult. Now let us examine the second circle, a distance of three quarters of a mile from ground zero. Here it is before the explosion. Again, the flash and the blast. Notice that the damage is severe. Many streets are blocked with rubble. And this fact, combined with the large number of fires caused by the heat flash, will produce many problems for those responsible for rescue work. And so we come to the third, or one and a half mile circle. Here it is before, and now after. Windows are broken, roofing damaged, doors blown off their hinges and so on. Structural damage is unlikely to be heavy. In this area, a number of small fires would be started by the heat flash entering through windows of the upper and therefore more exposed floors, igniting curtains and other combustible materials. Beyond this distance from ground zero, damage will be confined to broken windows, fallen tiles and chimney pots and similar minor damage. Only in exceptional circumstances would there be major structural damage. That then would be the effect of a nominal atomic bomb detonated at 1,000 feet over a British city. You may have noticed that no mention has yet been made of casualties. In Hiroshima, the aircraft carrying the atomic bomb was mistakenly thought to be a reconnaissance plane, and the population did not take cover. That mistake cost many thousands of lives. In a British city with wartime evacuation, with an efficient air raid warning system, and with the cooperation of an intelligent public using suitable shelters, such a terrible death roll could be very greatly reduced. The number of casualties, however, will depend on the state of preparedness of the population to meet such an eventuality. In particular, it will depend on the number of trained civil defense workers, who, together with the police and firefighting services, would be available and ready for action if and when the time should come. For the purpose of this film, the atomic bomb used will be assumed to be of nominal size and to be detonated at a height of 1,000 feet. We know that the first of the three effects of an airburst atomic bomb is that of heat. Heat from the searing flash at the start of the explosion. Although this heat flash, as it's called, may start a number of primary fires, it is not dangerous to human life, provided that a person has some form of protection or cover from it. Only those exposed in a direct, unshielded line to the bomb will be affected. The heat flash produces its own phenomenon, that of flash-burn shadow. All the ground surrounding an object is affected by the intense, momentary heat of the flash, with the exception of that part directly in the shadow of an object, like this fern leaf. This effect occurs so rapidly that the outline of the leaf is clearly left before the leaf itself is destroyed by the heat. In this case, the shadow of a man was left before he was struck down. Here, the flash came through the window and left the imprint of a man's pipe. This phenomenon can be used in determining the direction of ground zero. A simple device like this board, fixed in suitable positions near civil defense posts, will give the controller both the height and the direction of the burst, measured by the length and the angle of the center pole shadow. This shadow will be indelibly marked on the board while it's still fixed in place, and its reading will be true no matter where the blast effect may shift the board later. Should the population have failed to take cover prior to the atomic bomb explosion, Severe skin burns would be very heavy up to a distance of two miles from ground zero in clear weather. It's important to realize that the weather conditions at the time of the explosion have a marked effect on the range of the heat flash. In heavy mist, rain or fog, 
the effective range of the flash is more than halved. Types of clothing worn by unsheltered people will also affect the number of injuries from burns. Thick woolen garments offer the best protection and at the extreme range of the flash, lighter colored cloth is more heat resisting than dark colors. Covering of all normally exposed parts of the body with any material will invariably lessen the severity of the burns. However, if we assume as we have done that the population has taken cover, there's no danger directly from the heat flash. The indirect danger, that of fires started by the flash, may produce a number of problems and must be considered as a prominent factor with all atomic explosions. Any easily inflammable material exposed within a two mile radius of ground zero in clear weather is liable to be ignited by the heat flash. In this country, there is little use made of wood or other combustible material on the exterior of buildings. Therefore, the main danger from fire would be internal. The flash having entered through windows or other apertures. Only those windows directly exposed to the flash would be so affected. Therefore, it is likely that a large number of primary fires started will be situated on the upper floors of buildings. These fires may be quite small, started by ignited curtaining or furnishings and easily dealt with by hand-operated equipment. It's very important that the small fires occurring in otherwise undamaged areas be dealt with quickly. Otherwise, the spread of such fires would seriously impede the firefighting and rescue squads endeavoring to reach the more heavily damaged area. The risk of fire from heat flash can be very greatly reduced by the simple expedient of whitewashing the window panes. It must be remembered that although glass in itself offers little protection against heat flash, any more than it stops the heat from the sun, the glass will not be shattered until after the flash has done its harm. This is because the shock wave of blast travels much slower. Any white or lime wash on the glass will reflect heat and reduce its penetrating power considerably. All skylights should be similarly treated. At night time, a wooden blackout screen fitted to the window will also serve a useful purpose as a deterrent to heat flash. The wood may be charred on the outside, but it should prevent fires being started in the room. All such screens should, of course, be whitewashed on the outside. If the curtaining material is very heavy, it will also serve to stop the heat flash from entering, though there's a risk of the curtains themselves igniting. There are, however, several ways of making materials fire resisting. This can be done at home and householders will be advised on how this is best done. The more serious fire situations may be expected at the three quarter mile range from ground zero. These will include a number of secondary fires started by collapsing buildings. It will be important to warn the public that all domestic cooking and heating appliances must be turned off at the mains before taking cover. It will be even more necessary than in the last war to obtain cooperation from the public in clearing their attics and lofts and in providing their own firefighting equipment to deal with small outbreaks. Remember, with the explosion of an atomic bomb, Fire will be a very great danger to human life and property. For the purpose of this film, we will assume that the atomic bomb used is a nominal bomb and that it is detonated at a height of 1,000 feet. We know that one of the three effects of an atomic bomb burst is that of nuclear radiation and that this effect is itself divided into two stages, immediate radiation and residual radiation. It must be emphasized that nuclear radiation will not be a source of danger to the civil defense worker provided that he is protected from the immediate radiation and does not exceed the specified safe dose of residual radiation.
The rays emitted by the bomb at the moment of the bomb's detonation come into the first immediate category. The most important of these are gamma rays and neutrons. The lethal range of the neutrons is smaller than that of the gamma rays, so the latter must be our main consideration. The effects due to the activity induced by neutrons in various materials will be examined with the other effects due to deposited fission products when we deal with residual radiation. All forms of radiation can be measured in terms of wavelength. Gamma rays have a very short wavelength. Related to other and more easily identified forms of radiation, gamma rays have a wavelength even shorter than X-rays, which, as you know, have the power to penetrate a human body and affect a photographic plate exposed on the far side. At a longer wavelength are the ultraviolet rays produced by the sun. Longer again is that of visible light. Then infrared rays and considerably longer the radar and radio wavelengths and so on. It will be seen then that the gamma ray wavelengths are among the shortest wavelengths known to man. Short wavelengths also mean high energy and therefore a high power of penetration. Gamma rays cause damage to human tissues and can be lethal if the dose is large enough, as indeed can X-rays unless properly controlled by a doctor to specified safe doses. Gamma rays are in fact used medically for destroying tumours and other internal growths, but of course they are then controlled to a very fine degree to ensure safety. When an atomic bomb is detonated, gamma rays are emitted in all directions at a very high speed and may travel up to a mile and a half from the burst. Except in the case of very massive doses, there is no immediate physical reaction to these rays entering the body. It may be some days before radiation sickness is experienced. With a lethal dose of gamma rays, death will usually occur at any time up to six or eight weeks later. The gamma ray dose received by a human being when an atomic bomb is detonated is governed by two factors. First, the distance from the explosion, and secondly, the amount of protection available. As the rays stream out from the source, they are spread over an ever-widening sphere, so that their density falls off very rapidly. At a range of three quarters of a mile, the density is so far reduced that the dose received should not be lethal, although it may cause serious illness. At distances greater than three quarters of a mile from the explosion, the energy and penetrating power of the rays fall off rapidly, and by the time they reach the mile and a half circle, they are virtually harmless. The second factor, that of protection, is of great importance. For protection from gamma rays, the denser the material, the less the thickness required. At one quarter of a mile from ground zero, protection from a lethal dose may be obtained from seven inches of steel. The same degree of protection can be obtained with two feet of concrete or three feet of well-packed earth. Air raid shelters of the last war type will afford definite protection depending on their distance from the explosion and with an additional covering of earth or concrete can be efficient to a substantial degree. Now we will examine the kind of radiation known as residual. As its name implies, it concerns the radioactive particles left on the ground after the explosion. Into an area some quarter of a mile radius from ground zero may fall a quantity of radioactive particles called fission products. These are the products resulting from an atomic explosion. They are radioactive and emit gamma rays. The rising cloud following the explosion is also filled with these particles. They may be carried by the wind and will be widely dispersed. Some may fall to earth anywhere downwind. This is called the fallout. The radioactivity of the fallout is likely to be relatively weak and therefore not a serious problem. The neutrons which were emitted from the bomb at the same time as the gamma rays 
also have the power to cause residual radiation. With this type of airburst bomb, a number of these neutrons will reach the ground in the vicinity of the explosion. In doing this, they may make other objects on the ground radioactive. That is, they cause those objects to radiate gamma and other rays. Except with air bursts of about 500 feet or below, the potentially dangerous gamma rays of residual radiation, whether caused by fission products at ground zero, or by neutrons, or in the fallout, are not likely to be present in sufficient quantities to be a serious hazard, unless exposure to them is prolonged. In the case you see here, there is believed to be some radiation due to a freak fallout, and a reconnaissance party is sent to investigate. Radioactive rays are measured in dose rates of units received per hour. These units are called Rundkens. It's known that a single dose of 500 Rundkens has a 50-50 chance of being lethal to human beings, and that a dose of 25 Rundkens has no observable effect. Although it's unlikely that civil defence personnel will absorb even this amount in the normal course of their duties, nevertheless, in special circumstances, they may be called upon to receive considerably greater doses, since it's known that a dosage of 50 Rundkens can be absorbed without undue risk. In these cases, civil defence workers may, where circumstances permit, be withdrawn temporarily from radioactive areas. Although it might at first sight appear advisable for civil defence personnel to wear respirators so as to avoid inhaling radioactive particles, the real danger is from the residual gamma radiation and provided this is restricted to 25 Rundkens, it has been found that there is no danger from inhaled particles. It is possible for the radioactive dust of fission products to contaminate exposed food and water and thereby lead to radioactive poisoning. However, food and water stored in undamaged airtight containers would be immune from the risk of contamination. It is important to realize that radioactivity in any of its forms cannot be destroyed. This makes decontamination a difficult problem. It does, however, decay rapidly with the passing of time. In the case of fission product contamination, at the end of the first 24 hours, the gamma ray activity is only one fiftieth of what it was after the first hour. Provided the civil defense worker is adequately protected from gamma rays at the time of the explosion, and that an accurate record is kept of the dosage he has received, radiation is the least dangerous of the atomic bomb's three effects.